This is ABC Fora. This is Google Maps in April 2005. We, uh, we started out, we, 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 launched, uh, we launched Maps in February just with North America, and in April, um, we added the United Kingdom, and we thought we would put it in a geographically correct location. <laughs> Relative, and then put a bunch of blue sort of as a promise of maps to come. We got a lot of fun emails from this. Um, this was um, uh, in the very beginning of George Bush's second term, and a lot of our users... <laughs> a lot of our users thought we were trying to predict what the world would look like at the end of his term. <laughs> but that's, uh, <laughs> that's not at all true. One of our, our favorite emails was this guy in, in all caps. He wrote, you forgot... Poland, <laughs> and uh, and so um, and, and so we added Poland. <laughs> we now have Poland, and I, I bring this up because Robert asked that I, I say a few words about where Maps is at now. It's been five years since we launched. Jensen and I left the team two and a half years ago. Has it stabilized? And the answer is very much no. There is an incredible amount of innovation going on. It's a big team now. Incredible engineers. When we go hang out with them, the sense is still that they're just getting started on this mission of mapping the world, or rather, of organizing the world's information geographically, which is what maps are all about. Um, and, and the way it works, of course, is you, you go, you want to launch maps in a new country, you find a source of mapping data, you evaluate it, you learn how addresses work, and then we have maps in a new country. The, the problem is, most countries of the world, there are no digital mapping databases we can just go and license like there is here. And so I want to tell you a little story. Um, when we launched, when maps looked like my previous screen, a team of engineers, Google engineers in Bangalore, India, wanted to have maps for India. And they quickly learned they couldn't just find a database license. And so they said, let's just build something so that volunteers can input maps. And we said, sure. And they set out to do it a year and a half later. They hadn't actually produced anything. And in part, it was because what we had built was so young that it couldn't really handle those kinds of features. And at the time, I was a big, bad manager. I actually traveled to India to tell them to stop. It was too much distraction for us. And my Indian colleagues said, sure, fine, whatever, we'll stop. To their credit, they kept going. <laughs> And sometime later, um, they launched this thing, which you, which you won't know about. It's an application called Google Mapmaker, um, which lets volunteers, I won't, I won't show you because I don't know how, how it actually works, but it lets volunteers input maps. We have it uh, running in 164 countries around the world, and it lets us um, do maps for countries that are um, still developing. Here's, a, here's a, a city, almost certainly not pronounced Bulawayo, in Zimbabwe. And you can see how detailed the maps are here and how well they track um, to the satellite images. And this is all done by volunteers because of this team in India. And this is lesson number one that I want to draw out, the importance of passion uh, in entrepreneurship. And these guys in India, they had passion because they were solving a problem that they cared deeply about, namely having uh, digital maps available for this part of the world. I'll show you a little fun video that they put together, if I can find it. Um, of how it, how it looks if you, if you do a little time stop video here. This is uh, volunteers building maps for Karachi. Sorry, I didn't preload this. Here, here it looks like just over a few weeks, a bunch of volunteers got together to map. This is Karachi, Pakistan, but this is going on in lots and lots of places around the world. And this work will never stop. There's always more detailed maps, and there's always more countries to map. And so, yes, things are alive and well in the mapping world. Now, back to this, um, the history of maps. This is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, a little timeline of my tenure in Silicon Valley. The beautiful blue graph here is, um, is the NASDAQ composite index that tracks technology stocks. You can see how much fun we had. I graduated with a PhD around here, joined a startup. We raised 45 millions. We were going to be very, very, very rich. We spent it all, and here we got laid off. <laughs> like I said, uh, we are familiar with failure as well. And it was really painful, actually, to be laid off. Turned out to be a blessing in disguise, a uh, very good disguise. Um, but this was how MAPS started. 
Um, so Jens, who is much smarter than me, got laid off three months earlier than I did. <laughs> and by the time I got my very predictable pay, uh, pink slip, Jens already had worked out what we're going to work on. This was how math started. He said, look, mapping, and you guys will remember this. This is in 2003, two, I forget. Uh, maps on the internet was, were very simple. They were popular, but simple. You keyed in an address, you got a map. You keyed in two addresses, you got driving directions. A few sites around the web had maps sort of down in the corner next to a bunch of text. And Jens argued that if you made the map big enough and pretty enough and dynamic and interactive enough, you could actually use the map as a platform for all of these services. And he described this, this wonderful demo of how you would look at a map and key, we were both movie buffs. You would key in the name of a movie and it would show you which theaters on the map showed that movie. You'd click one, see the billboard hover, hovering over the map, and you could go buy your ticket right there. And I was sold immediately. Yint claims it took a couple of hours. I like my version better. <laughs> um, at the time, um, I was in Australia. I had moved here. Uh, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and with us tonight. Um, we, we, she's Cuban, and we couldn't be together in California. The US is not very hospitable to Cubans. So we had moved here. Um, but now started this little musical continent thing. Jens was in California with a work visa, just been laid off, had to move back to Denmark. He moved in with mom. He hates when I tell people that. <laughs> um, I left my girlfriend here, moved into his apartment. We were really trying to like, lower our budget. And then we started prototyping his ideas. And we tried getting more people involved. We knew a lot of engineers in California, and we tried to get them involved. Um, we were going to pay them with shares in our non-existing company. Um, but they all turned us down, and they all had the same reason. And this was a reason we heard many, many times in the cause of building maps, which is, look, you can't make money from maps. This was sort of the well-known thing. Everyone had tried and failed. No one argued about our technology not being interested but you can't make money from maps. We heard this over and over, and at the time, it was really sort of disheartening. But now that I'm a seasoned innovator, these are real gray hair here, um, I've come to actually really enjoy when people tell me that it can't be done. And this is sort of the second lesson of tonight, that I, I've come to form this theory that if no one tells you that something can't be done or shouldn't be done, you're probably not being ambitious enough. And you're probably not actually on some innovative track. And so now I go actually seek out the more experienced and smarter people I can get to tell me I'm crazy, the better I feel. This is ABC Fora.